Okay, biodiversity maintenance in log tropical forests. So the last couple of lectures we talked about timber production <coughs> in tropical forests and how uh, different ways of producing timber from tropical forests to satisfy different objectives for timber production. We saw how um, in some cases you would have complete removal of the forest and replacement of that forest with a plantation. Uh, to maximize timber production. Uh, we also saw that um, one type of timber management system called a natural regeneration management system allowed uh, you to use the forest for other uses mainly because the biodiversity and the ecosystem processes are preserved in these forests and they're preserved for timber production reasons um, so that um, people can um, still produce timber without any inputs because the forest will generate seedlings and saplings and eventually mature trees which could then be harvested in perpetuity. Now following on from that um, RIL and natural regeneration timber production systems I want to talk about how biodiversity is can be maintained in tropical forests which are used for timber production. Now I'm focusing in on timber production forests because uh, that tends to be one of the main reasons or the main economic activities in tropical fo forests at the moment. So I want to take a look at valuing biodiversity in logged tropical forests. It's not really valuing it per se, it's more taking a look at how biodiversity has become more important to people over time and that um, how people are beginning to be aware that most forests are logged, how can we value this biodiversity and therefore how can we preserve this biodiversity. I look at excluding logging to main bio uh, maintain biodiversity in a forest, maintaining biodiversity in log stands, how in even in forests which are logged, how we can try and maintain biodiversity, and timing uh, harvesting to maintain biodiversity. And finally I'll take a look at plantation systems and biodiversity and how we can even incorporate replacement systems um, to maintain biodiversity in a uh, forest landscape. So first of all, valuing biodiversity in logged forests. Log logging inevitably will modify or change the uh, vegetation communities and the tree species communities in a forest. It will modify the density of some species and extirpate or eliminate some species from a particular forest. The species which will tend to be extirpated or lost are the ones which cannot tolerate disturbance and the species which rely very much on a closed canopy and they, they won't survive if the canopy is opened up, humidity lowered and light let in and so on. So logging will modify a forest and it will uh, cause that forest to lose some biodiversity. Of course that really depends a lot on how much logging is done. In the past it hasn't really been on the radar of most forest managers. Instead people are just managing forests to produce timber and they haven't really worried about maintaining biodiversity and maintaining ecosystem processes. It's just been a matter of if it doesn't harm the production of timber, then we don't care if uh, something is lost. So resource production, in, in particular um, timber production, was the overwhelming priority from these forests. And any sort of training or um, methods or management systems put in place for biodiversity conservation tended to be ignored, particularly in tropical countries where first of all um, multinational timber companies really didn't um, care what the other uses of tropical forests were, they were just there to harvest timber. So 
managing the forest for biodiversity conservation was pretty low down on the list of why um, of timber producers. However, things are changing. Um, Trinidad is an example of that. Maintaining species other than timber trees is becoming important as forests are seen more and more as multi-use areas. So for instance in Trinidad the hunters have a fairly loud political voice and so they are not going to want the forest to be replaced, degraded to a point where hunting is no longer possible. They care about the populations of the game animals in these forests and so they will try and uh, manage or have the forest manage so that uh, game animals are uh, maintained and we'll take a look and see how we can do that. <coughs> Conservation and um, recreation are also um, uses of tropical forests which are becoming more and more important as we can see also in Trinidad so that um, forests need to be maintained in such a state where they are useful for these other uses as well. So biodiversity is integral to a lot of these other uses so maintaining this biodiversity is very important. So there are two ways to maintain forest structure, biodiversity and ecosystem proce um, processes in the, faces, in the face of, of the pressures that timber production inevitably brings. So the two ways are to leave enough of the forest unlogged and untouched to enable natural recolonization of the logged forest. Okay, so all the species which are going to be extirpated or disturbed by logging can find refuge in these unlogged parts of the forest and then recolonize the log parts once the logging has finished and once the canopies have closed over once again. The other way in which it can be done is to practice logging techniques which avoid loss of plant and animal species and allow for quick regeneration after disturbance. <coughs> so in this way the damage is minimized uh, so that um, the animals are least disturbed and um, when uh, logging finishes the animals which are subject to disturbance can recolonize very quickly. So it's probably best to maintain biodiversity to practice both of these ways of maintaining um, biodiversity. So in your forest you should have areas which are maintained uh, for without logging for biodiversity conservation and in the areas where you do log you should practice logging techniques which maintain the biodiversity in ecosystem processes. So leaving enough forest unlogged to maintain plants and animals <coughs> excuse me those uh, logged unlogged areas need to be large so that they can cater for the majority of species even those with fairly large home ranges and those which are severely affected by edge effects and they need to be connected to one another so that populations of species can interchange and support one another um, in the face of uh, genetic problems or uh, stochastic elimination of a population in one patch the other patches can recolonize. These patches can also serve more than one function. They can act as watercourse reserves to keep vegetation around watercourses to minimize erosion and so on. They can um, act as seed production reserves which allow um, foresters to harvest seeds of um, important species to use in the rest of the forest to try and enrich the logged forest uh, with timber species without opening the canopy of course. Um, they may be watershed reserves. 
if an area is a watershed for a reservoir, a water reservoir, then keeping the um, cover at a maximum all the time is required to minimize sedimentation in the reservoir and the w maintaining the water quality. So how much of the forest should be preserved? Um, it's different for different taxa. Some taxa will need more, some taxa will need less. Figures of about 10 to 20 percent are generally accepted. And if you remember, uh, if you have 10 to 20 percent of your forest left, um, assuming that the rest of the forest is completely eliminated, which is not what we're talking about here, at least 50 percent of the species remain. So here is our hypothetical forest. These red lines are roads. Uh, the dark green are areas which are left unlogged. The blue lines is uh, a water course, a network of water courses. Uh, the light green are the areas which are logged. As you can see, parts of the um, forest are protected from logging. There's no logging there and some of those areas are actually multiple use. They will actually protect the water course from erosion and so on and they also form corridors by which species populations from each of the different reserves can move between these different blocks. There's uh, also part of the reserve along this road as well. Not all of the water courses are uh, shielded by our remaining forests um, and perhaps they should. But it still leaves 70 to 80 percent of the forest available for timber harvesting. So parts of these forests will be harvested in sequence and um, there will always be a reserve next door to them where uh, where the populations of animals can come in and recolonize these areas. Okay, the, it's probably a good idea for these areas also to be logged selectively at very low density so the canopy isn't open up and uh, reduced impact logging techniques used to minimize the damage in these particular areas. So this is an ideal situation of a forest which can both provide timber production opportunities but also maintain biodiversities. So as I said, size of the reserves depends on species targeted. Um, species like ocelots, for instance, may need larger areas because they have larger home ranges. Species like bush cockroaches, which live in the forest floor, may need fairly small areas. The preserve areas should be linked by water courses or road reserves so that uh, species populations may support one another. A long cutting cycle may also allow plant and plants and animals to recolonize from adjacent forests. However, this may be um, less economic, so it may not actually occur. The land use at the edge of the reserve is also important. So in our reserve on these edges, we need to make sure that the land use is not inimicable to the forests in the reserve. Now it could be a problem for the forest in the reserve if practices on there allow wind to blow directly into the canopy of these forests and therefore dry out and exacerbate edge effects. If um, there's fires which are burnt right up to the edge of the forest, which may penetrate into the forest and damage the forest. And so if it is at all possible, it is a good idea to control the land use practices in a buffer zone around the forest. So maybe, maybe half a kilometer or so. And the ideal land use practices, which may still be economic, is to plant plantations. So plantations which have a tree-like structure but still provide a return are ideal for edges of these forest reserves. So that tree-like structure will um, make sure that fires don't burn up to the edge, deflect wind away from the edges of the um, reserved and so on.
Forests can be broken up into stands with a central core preserve zone and log stands recolonized from the preserve zone. Or you can have preserve zones around the edges. But the idea is to make sure each stand is adjacent to a reserve zone so that species can recolonize from these reserve zones. All right, here's a photograph um, showing how land use practices on the edge of the forest reserve can have a big impact. Here, the land has been cleared right up to the edge of the forest, so you can see that wind and fire can penetrate directly into the forest. A better situation would be a plantation planted along the edge of the forest, which would prevent the edge effects, many of the edge effects, um, in the forest itself. And here we have <coughs> an area of forest which has been logged and as you can see the canopy is opened up and you have a lot of our selected species growing up and smothering the seedlings and the saplings of the timber species so this is not a good situation for the forest so the forest needs to try and maintain that closed canopy as much as possible so maintaining some biodiversity in log stands, procedures to maintain biodiversity in log stands have been worked out and they are generally these reduced impact logging techniques. Ideally these should be used in conjunction with preserved areas and redu reduced impact logging techniques should be used in the logged areas, keeping the canopy closed or main, uh, minimizing the canopy's opening and reducing the impact or the damage to the regeneration in the forest so not only can they be harvested again relatively quickly but they can also be they also maintain all the species uh, in the forest other practices involve preserving resources used by plants and animals in a log stand um, Resources which are logged by plants and animals in a log stand but are not actually economic could be things like fruiting trees or big large trees which are hollow. Uh, fruiting trees obviously provide a food resource for these animals and very large hollow trees will provide quite often a roosting or nesting place for a lot of these animals. And one of the most obvious ways of uh, maintaining biodiversity in a logged stand is terrain maximizing the closed canopy in that logged forest. Um, so here is a log forest, try and maintain that closed canopy. Here we have a picture showing the canopy state in the different logging practices. A clear cut logging area obviously completely opens up the canopy as does slash and burn. Conventional logging as you can see, you're seeing these skid trails and they're all over the place and you're having um, opened up canopy areas where the trees have been felled. But we compare that to a reduced impact logging area. The skid trails are generally remain underneath the canopy and there's far fewer uh, canopy openings. There's only one canopy opening seen there. Okay, so reduced impact logging is far best the, the most uh, useful way of harvesting in those tropical forests to retain diversity. Animals also require maintenance of food trees, so things like figs um, have been quoted as a good example. Fig trees or ficus trees uh, here's a habitat shot, a general picture of the fruit and inside the fruit. These um, figs, fruits, uh, tend to be available throughout the year, okay, and they can be used by a variety of animals. The fact that they're available throughout the year makes them a very important food supply. Because they're available throughout the year, when other fruits are not available, plants and animals can rely on these figs. So these figs can, these fig trees can be the difference between life and death for many of the species with it, of animals within a tropical forest.
The problem with figs is that they are completely useless for timber production, mainly because they have these ducts um, which have a white sap running through all the timber and it is simply no good for timber production. So they can also grow very big so they can take up a lot of resources uh, and foresters don't find them very good trees to keep in the forest so quite often they're weeded out but because they are a keystone species for many animal species for uh, providing food during the dry season uh, they should be kept uh, trees which provide nesting and roosting sites are also important standing dead trees also perform this role and can form about five percent of the forest so we need to watch out for these dead trees and they're often removed as part of uh, forest operations for civicultural and safety reasons and this can really severely limit the populations of some animals here we have some examples of animals using these dead and hollow trees and branches here is a a possum inside a hollow tree you can see him nesting in there this is a hornbill in southeast asia nesting in the hollow of a tree there uh, the female goes into the tree and she and the male seals up the entrance except for this slit and she will raise the chicks in there and the male will fly and bring in food for the female and the chicks uh, while they're growing up and this is a hollow branch uh, which has fallen. So all of these provide habitat not only for these species but a var vast variety of species of animals and birds and insects and so they maintain the biodiversity of a logged forest and therefore these large dead trees should be maintained in these forests. Okay. All right, we can also time harvesting to maintain biodiversity. Generally, harvesting can be uh, the best way of timing harvesting is to um, make sure that the um, harvesting occurs at as long a period as possible. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, in practice, you need to as long as time as possible, but as I've got here, a 100-year cutting cycle is quite often not economic. So there is almost inevitably some modification in ecosystem structure. And the question is, is it enough to lose species? And the idea is to try and minimize that. So if it is a problem then a large enough preserved habitat is necessary so we need to have a forest like we saw before um, with a preserve and the um, harvested areas around it another way of arranging a forest could be something like this having the preserve in the center and having these different stands which are logged sequentially around it so stand one two three four five but each of the stands are uh, connected to the preserve so when they are disturbed um, the disturbance tolerant uh, intolerant species can either flee into the preserve and once um, disturbance is finished they can go back in they can recolonize so that's the ideal situation all right so i just want to mention in the end there plantation systems and biodiversity plantations themselves don't significantly protect species richness because you remove the natural forest and replace it with a plantation usually an exotic species and most species are lost within the plantation but plantations can be good for biodiversity conservation two ways first of all by taking pressure off um, natural forests for timber production so if you have a plantation which is providing the timber needs for your society you're less um, you have a less less of a need for harvesting in the 
natural forests, well so the theory goes. Although it may not be work out that way because it seems with humans if you create a market for timber then that market doesn't care where the timber comes from and if it's cheaper to come from the natural forest then that's where it'll come from. But it is it does work in certain situations. Plantations may also be important for biodiversity by maintaining those buffer zones as I mentioned er earlier. They reduce edge effects and they create um, a barrier against things like fire and wind um, penetrating too far into the natural forest. Plantations, because they are also value added, may also protect natural, natural forest against squatting because authorities are much more likely to uh, crack down on squatting if it occurs in a plantation area. If a forest is surrounded by plantations then people are less likely to go squatting uh, into the forest along the edges of the forest because they are all protected by plantations. So plantations may protect natural forests against um, unsupervised or unscheduled um, conversion into um, uh, non-forest. Oh, it is just a diagram which shows how um, an original forest here may be protected by a plantation. So the plantation um, will deflect wind away from the understory of the natural forest and also under here would not promote fire and so the um, the wind won't be able to um, sorry the fire won't be able to penetrate into the natural forest and here we have a example of an abrupt edge and a gradual edge the abrupt edge wind can penetrate quite deeply into the forest interior with a gradual edge maybe with plantation the wind is deflected up and over so it's good to have a controlled edge to your forest all right, just in finishing, I'm just showing you a slide of the Victoria Miaro Forest Reserve. This is um, Guayaguayari down here. This is Miaro up here and Maruga just here. Rio Claro is just here. And this is the Victoria Miaro Forest Reserve. Okay, so this is the county of Miaro and this is the county of Victoria and the Victoria Miaro Forest Reserve stretches between. These areas here, or all the forested areas are the khaki green areas. This area here is plantation, uh, teak plantation specifically. All these pinkish colors are oil production fields um, and broken forest. Oh sorry, the reddish areas are oil production fields. These pinkish areas are broken forests which have been um, in the case this is naturally broken because it's close to a, a um, mud volcano but over here it would be a broken forest because of fires and maybe oil activity. Um, the This area here is a wildlife sanctuary Trinity Hills Wildlife Sanctuary and the black hatched areas are the periodic block system which I was telling you about, that natural regeneration system. Uh, this area was an open range system uh, which was less sustainable but the periodic block system was much more sustainable and as you can see it tends to be surrounding this area of preserved forests so that animals can definitely recolonize these areas which may be disturbed. Some things which may block recolonization are these pipelines however. So you've got a few pipelines here, a few pipelines here. That may hinder the movement of animals recolonizing these areas. Okay, so that's an introduction to how biodiversity can be maintained in timber production forests. It's a topic which is um, gaining more and more importance in um, uh, management of tropical forests around the world. Okay, thank you very much.